Yeah. Like they do for you, or you just buy it and you get it or something? No, they have an app for you. Okay. Because they get on the last flight? Yeah. They're just like, what? Yeah, they're like, what? So you? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, what comes after the internal carotid? What does it turn into? The internal carotid turns into the middle cerebral. Oh, okay. Now these things um, supply obviously different parts of the nervous system. I mentioned the other day that a problem with the vertebral artery produces a posterior circulation <coughs> uh, problem. That's going to be more brainstem related versus a middle cerebral problem or anterior cerebral, which is going to produce more cortex, cerebral cortex related <coughs> problems. So you can kind of tell if you're looking at a stroke victim, a CVA, uh, is it posterior circulation or anterior circulation? And I mentioned those terms uh, earlier in the week. God, it seems like last month. Last month, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me just tell you, uh, the, the posterior cerebral goes to supply the occipital lobe. The middle cerebral goes to supply what's called the dorsolateral surface, this, the whole outside surface of your cortex. You can see it running through the lateral fissure there. The anterior cerebral goes up between the two lobes to supply the midline of your cortex. If you take, today when you take the brain and you pull the two hemispheres apart, and look down there on the top of the corpus callosum, that big fiber connecting. The anterior cerebral are right there on top of it. Because different parts of the cortex control different functions, if a person has a CBA and they exhibit arm weakness or leg weakness or speech or whatever, you can, by knowing the circulation, you can say, ah, that was a lesion of the left middle cerebral artery, or ah, that was a lesion of the right anterior cerebral artery. So by the end of the summer, you'll be able to do that. One of the things that can go bad with the circle of Willis is, uh, these are called berry aneurysms. They look like little uh, berries. It's not the name of somebody. It looks like a little uh, ball, a little berry. They can occur on uh, virtually any part of the circle of Willis. And uh, most people don't even know they have them. Um, if they do rupture, though, they're, they're highly lethal little boogers. Like 50% of the people will die if they rupture because it's in the, this circle of Willis here is on the floor of the cranial vault. It's hard to get to. Okay. You can get to it. Uh, if you discover a berry aneurysm, like in this um, arteriogram, you can clip the base of the aneurysm like this, or you can do a procedure called coiling. You can, uh, interventional radiologists can take a, take a, uh, a wire or a tube, actually it's a very thin tube, and go all the way up into, well they go up through here, they go all the way up into the vasculature. They thread, you can see the wire right there. <coughs> they thread that wire into the aneurysm and coming out of the, the end of the wire, it's not a wire, it's like a scope or a tube. They put wire and this wire coils up inside the aneurysm like that and its presence causes the blood that's already stagnant in there to clot. And so essentially you cure the aneurysm by clotting it off. Uh, Georgie Ann Snowden, she's an uh, interventional radiologist at Integra. She's probably the best in the state <coughs> at coiling. She can reach anything with uh, her uh, devices. Yeah. So is it essentially like a catheter? Kind of like what they would do for like a stent? Yeah, it's kind of like a stent, but it's much, much smaller because you're dealing with much, much smaller vessels. And uh, it's, it's pretty impressive to be able to direct this thing 
through the different turns to get to where you need to go. Um, so this is an example of when it ruptures, when one ruptures, you see all this black uh, clotted blood up here. This is not good. I bought my house from Snowden's husband. They weren't married at the time. No, they were married at the time. They, he had moved into her house in Nichols Hills. But he is, his other wife and kids, she was killed in a car wreck. Mm -hmm. But um, he, he's a freaky guy. But anyway, <laughs> um, when I bought the house, every square inch of every wall in that house had a picture on it with the family. You know, the wife and kids and him, vacations and stuff like that. I bet there were 10,000 pictures in that house. So they were all gone when I moved in, but the nails worked. Uh, so I'm still getting nails out of the 20 years later. So. Here's the arterial distribution of those three main uh, arteries here. Here's the anterior cerebral, supplying the medial surface. Posterior cerebral, supplying the occipital lobe. Middle cerebral supplying the um, dorsolateral surface. I mean, it's to the point where if you're left handed, one out of five of you will have your speech center here. So if you're left on the right side of the cerebral cortex, right there. So if you're left-handed and you have a stroke and you can't speak four out of four out of five times, well, 20% of the time, if you're left-handed and you can't speak, I know that that right middle cerebral artery is blocked. That's where the lesion was. If you're left-handed and you can still speak, then it's on the other side. So it gets very specific. And of course, also, you get an MRI and a CT, and that'll tell you where you're to. <laughs> but when I was a student, there were no CTs or MRIs. That was before they were invented. So you had to rely on your anatomy to figure things out. All right, any, anything uh, about, any questions about what I've said uh, so far? This month. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the, the eyeball for uh, the eye for a minute. There's seven bones that create the orbit here. I don't care that you know them. I mean, you don't have to be able to reconstruct the orbit, but just know that it's it's a complicated structure, from the frontal bone to the zygomatic bone, the maxillary bone, nasal bone, ethmoid bone. There's a lot of bones that create the uh, orbit. When you look in through the orbit, you see the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure, and there's the optic canal in the back, back there. You're going to be looking at this a lot on <coughs> CTs and MRIs if you're working in an emergency room or you do ENT or ophthalmology, things like that. Uh, you'll need to know this anatomy quite well. Um, the optic canal uh, <coughs> is, as it says here, transmits two structures, the ophthalmic artery and cranial nerve 2. Cranial nerve 2 is covered by dura mater, which fuses with the sclera of the eyeball. So increase in intracranial pressure, like from a subdural hematoma, or any type of increase in pressure inside the skull, is within the dura is going to push outwards on the, on the retina. And you can see it. You can see intracranial pressure by looking through somebody's pupil. The superior orbital fissure, that's everything that goes through it that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the inferior orbital fissure is a little bit different um, because things that go through the superior orbital fissure are headed for the orbit. I mean, headed for the eyeball. To run the eyeball or for the eyeball itself. 
things that go through the inferior orbital fissure are usually headed out. So the maxillary division of V2 goes through the inferior orbital fissure and then buries itself inside this bone into a canal <coughs> and it exits the infraorbital foramen right there. It doesn't have anything to do with the, the eyeball. Follow me? That's the biggest thing that you see uh, related to the inferior, infraorbital fissures is that V2. The conjunctiva is a uh, tissue that, if you look at the eyeball from the front, this stuff that covers the eyeball here, and it extends onto the undersurface of the eyelid, is the conjunctiva. Conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva, either allergic bacteria or viral. Which of those three do you think would start bilateral? Allergic. Allergic. Allergic conjunctivitis is bilateral. You don't have an allergy in one eye, you have in both eyes. 90% of conjunctivitis, if it's infectious, is viral. It will start in one eye, and the next day it shows up in the other eye. It spreads really quick because, you know, you're, you're sneezing, and then you rub your eye, and you get it over here, and then start, you start rubbing your eye like that, and you do like that, and now you transfer it to the other side. That's the story of your life. That's the story of your life. And bacteria is the same way, except that it's it's harder to transmit, but it's more serious and um, the eyelids themselves uh, have several different glands in them. Uh, one of them I mentioned on that first day, I talked about the, the glands of mole in the eyelids, and then you have the glands of zeiss, and then you have the mamobian glands right there. If you flip somebody's eyelid up, if you take a Q-tip, and put right here, and then grab their eyelashes, you can flip their eyelids up and look at, look under the, at the under surface of the upper lid very well, very easily. It's part of the exam when somebody comes in, you know, having gotten something in their eye, and you're going to examine their eye, one of the things you do is evert the lid. And that's all you do is you just put a Q-tip right there, and just grab the eyelid and flip it up. It's really easy to do. And you can see these little stripes here that are the mabobian glands. Also in the eyelid, there's a little cartilaginous plate called a tarsal plate. If you take your eye, your finger, I could take my fingers and just gently squeeze my, my eye, upper lid here. I can feel that tarsal plate. It's a little thin plate in there made of cartilage. You have the lashes uh, at the edges of the eyelids, and the gland openings are there. That's where the styes occur. The lacrimal gland rests out here, upper and outer, up here. The, the tears form and enter the surface of the eyeball here and flush across the eyeball and gather in these two little holes, these two puncta, are the inferior and the superior lacrimal puncta. So the, the tears form over here and drain right there. And you continuously make uh, tears throughout the day. There are two other parts of the, uh, that you can see. One of them is this fold of mucous membrane. It's called the plica. If you look on your neighbor's eye, you can see it there. It's a little fold. And then there's the attachment here. It's called the uh, caron, right there. Is that a caron in the cluster of boils? That's a carbuncle. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> Close. All right. We know that the cornea is innervated by cranial nerve 5. I mentioned that before. That's the herpes zoster ophthalmicus, right? How does it get there? There's the ophthalmic division of 5. It enters the orbit through the superior orbit of fissure. And then there are several branches. The two of them that are very easy to find in lab today are the supraorbital and the supratrochlear. That big nerve right there is called the frontal nerve. So the frontal nerve divides into supraorbital and supratrochlear. It's real superficial, big as Dallas, easy to find. So where does that nerve go? It comes out here to supply the, the forehead. It's somatic afferent. Right? There's a lacrimal branch of five. This supplies the skin overlying the lateral part of the orbit here. It does not supply the lacrimal gland. <clears throat> because this is a sensory nerve, right? It's V1. This nerve right here is called the nasocilia. Uh, no, that's not the nasocilia. Uh, there, there it is right there, deep in there. It's a branch of V1 called the nasociliary. That nerve supplies your sinuses in here. So when you have pain from uh, sinusitis, it's right here, like deep in there. You feel it, the pressure and the pain right there. That's being transmitted over the nasociliary nerve. There are also branches called long ciliary branches that enter the back of the globe and go around to supply the cornea. The cornea is, is the layer that overlies the iris. So those are long ciliary branches of the G1. nerve? Uh -huh. They're called long ciliary. <laughs> we talked about the lacrimal apparatus here. There's the lacrimal gland that has several small ducts. Here are the two puncta. There's the canaliculi. That thing's called the lacrimal sac. It drains down through the bones here, the maxillary bone, to, to empty into the nasal cavity, lateral to this structure called the inferior concha. So if you stick your finger in your nose, you can't stick it all the way up to your brain because of these cartilaginous things that stick down. They're called concha. We'll go into more detail when we get to the nose. But suffice it to say today, the lacrimal apparatus drains below your nose. That's why when you're sitting there watching a uh, pretty woman or um, uh, fried green tomatoes or some uh, emotional flick, oh, they can't do that because then you're going to... Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, what happens when you sit there and you're crying and tears are streaming down? The tears are streaming down because you're producing so much, the canaliculi can't drain them away. So the tears overflow. And also, though, as you're crying down here, what are you also doing? Your nose is running, nose is running with clear fluid from the excess fluid that's entered now your lacrimal apparatus. Okay? And that's how that works. You can see it better here. Uh, everything's illustrated. Remember, the lacrimal nerve of V1 supplies this skin. It does not supply the lacrimal gland. I'll go into what supplies that later. Uh, in little babies, uh, newborns especially, uh, within the first few days, they don't uh, have a good, this is not formed real well, 
So it's, uh, who's got babies in here? Anybody got babies in here? Got a couple of you got babies? Um, one of the things you do with uh, little kids to promote uh, drainage here is you sit there and massage the uh, canaliculite. Anybody have problems like that? Everyone kept mentioning how they're like, oh, he has tears, right when he was born. Does that mean the kids developed early? Had what? Everyone kept talking oh, about he how had he tears. Did have tears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was weird. And some kids, though, they get uh, things get blocked up, and you have to have to massage the canaliculite. Okay. 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 All right. So uh, I said well, I'm going to tell you how to um, innervate the lacrimal gland. Well, here it is. Um, so follow me here for just a second. Here. <laughs> yes, don't write, don't write this down. Just follow me. Follow me. <clears throat> Blow this up if you can. <clears throat> this illustration. Don't worry about this one. Let's go to this one right here. So here we go. Yesterday I was talking about the chord of tympani and the submandibular and joining the lingual nerve. Let's, let me show you that. Here's the fifth cranial nerve there. There's trigeminal. There's the semilunar ganglion. There's the mandibular division. There's the lingual nerve going to the tongue. There's the seventh cranial nerve right there. It comes out of the pontomedullary junction. I mentioned that yesterday. It has a couple of branches. The branch that goes inferior, that right there, is going to come out the stylomastoid foramen to be the two Zanzibar bimotor car. However, before it gets out of the skull, it gives another branch right here called the corda tympani. That corda tympani joins the back of the lingual nerve has two things in the corda tympani, taste fibers that are going up with their cell bodies in the geniculate ganglion, which is right there. And the other thing is preganglionic parasympathetics that are going to come down in synapse in the submandibular ganglion. And from there, that goes to the sublingual and submandibular salivary glands. Anybody see that? The other branch of seven is this petrosal nerve here. Right in here, it's called the nerve of the pterygoid canal, but you don't need to worry about that. The point is, it's like a corda tympani. It's carrying taste in visceral efferents. Now, where it goes, it's looking for a ganglion, right? It's got to have a ganglion. It finds a ganglion right there called the pterygopalatine ganglion. Pterygopalatine ganglion. The pterygopalatine ganglion hangs off of V2. If we come over here to this illustration, there's V1, there's V2, there's the pterygopalatine ganglion right there. So those seventh nerve preganglionics are going to synapse there. The postganglionic is going to catch a ride on V1 over to the lacrimal gland. That's how you get the lacrimal gland. So the lacrimal gland, the submandibular gland, and the sublingual gland are all innervated by seven. On that image is submandibular gland and submandibular their ganglion switch, um, or am I just super confused? Yeah, they call the ganglion. Oh yeah, yeah. They've switched the the, the arrows. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. They're just going now the other thing, though, is from that pterygopalatine ganglion, you not only innervate the lacrimal gland, those postganglionic visceral efferents come down into the nose and innervate the mucous glands of your nose. 
What happens when you're crying? So if you want to cry, you got to stimulate the seventh nerve so you increase the production of tears. What always happens? Not only do you get the, the clear snot coming out, you get all this congestion, you know, <laughs> right, right? <laughs> so the seventh cranial nerve <coughs> supplies the mucus glands in the nose, the, saliv the salivary glands, submandibular and sublingual, and the lacrimal gland up here. Does V1 have any visceral interference at all? No. There's actually a syndrome. You know what Bell's palsy is? You heard of Bell's palsy? Bell's palsy is a, um, it's an inflammatory, uh, probably autoimmune disease related to the seventh cranial nerve. So we'll go in over this in, in that neuroanatomy <coughs> way. But it produces facial drooping, produces everything related to the seventh cranial nerve, including dry eyes because it affects the visceral efferents going to the lacrimal gland. So you always give somebody with Bell's palsy eye drops because corneal abrasion is really the number one side uh, complication. You also have a dry mouth because the salivary glands. When, he, when these nerves grow back, sometimes they can reverse their direction. So when you eat, you cry. <laughs> when you are watching fried green tomatoes, you salivate. That's called crocodile tears. They're fake tears. Like a crocodile when it eats, I guess it looks like it's crying. Oh. Crocodile tears. Never heard of that? No. Google it this weekend. I thought crocodile tears were just when you pretended to cry when you were little. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the fake tears are what crocodile tears mean. But it can happen when these two pathways, they get crossed. I, a friend of mine, his wife had Bell's palsy when she recovered. She had crocodile tears. It's a funny thing. Went out to eat steak with her one night. She's crying like a banshee. <laughs> and <just>, ah, ah, <laughs> and the tears were all over the place. And it was because she had this problem. And it doesn't, there's no correction for it. I don't know what a banshee actually is. But. Okay. If you look at the eyeball uh, itself, uh, we've got the outer cornea here. Um, the cornea comprises 90% of the refraction of your eye. 90%. Behind the cornea is the anterior chamber. There's the iris with the pupil. And then behind that, the posterior chamber. And then the lens. The lens is a um, flying saucer shaped structure that's pliable. The lens is attached peripherally around its edges by zonula fibers <clears throat> to the ciliary body. The lens has a capsule around it actually and the capsule is what's attached from, by the zonula <coughs> fibers to the ciliary body. You have the retina here, the, um, ophthalmic ner uh, the optic nerves rise in here and exit as the optic nerve. The retinal fibers will exit as the optic nerve. Within the optic nerve is a structure called the central artery and vein of the retina. That's how you supply the, the retina itself. There's some uh, features here. The cornea is avascular. What provides <coughs> sensation uh, to the cornea? It's five. There's a thing here called the corneal reflex or blink reflex. 
if I get you, to, if I take the patient, if I want to test cranial nerve, cranial nerves, what I do is I can have the patient look that way, and I come from this side with a, uh, if you take a cotton tip applicator and do like that and kind of make it out to a little point, you know, you draw the cotton out to a point, and I get you to look that way, and I touch your cornea, what do you do? You blink, right? So you felt it, that's five, you closed your eye, what closes the eye? Seven. Orbicularis oculi, that's seven. You open your eye back up, we're going to see in a minute, that's three. I just tested three cranial nerves by causing you to blink. Okay? It's called the blink reflex. You don't do that often because nobody really likes their cornea touch. <laughs> Interesting, if you wear um, contacts uh, over a period of time, you essentially uh, rub down the uh, pain receptors in your cornea. That's why people can do that wear contacts. So they don't have a blink reflex because they don't, their eyeball becomes insensitive mm -hmm. to pain. If you take your, if you leave your contacts out for a few months, you regrow those pain fibers and then you can get your blink reflex back. There are some muscles in the iris and in the ciliary body we need to discuss. There are two muscles in the iris right here. There are dilator muscles that cause the pupil to dilate. These are going to be innervated by the sympathetics. And there are sphincter muscles that are arranged circularly. These are going to cause the pupil to constrict. They're innervated by the parasympathetics. Very simple. If you look at them here, here are the dilator muscles right here. There are the constrictor muscles right here. So these are innervated by the sympathetics, those the parasympathetics. The other muscle here is called the ciliary body, attached to the zone of the fibers. So when the ciliary body contracts, when it contracts, it takes the pressure off of the zonular fibers. And when the pressure comes off of the zonular fibers, the, corn, the lens has a tendency to become more rounded. It's opposite of what you think. So when the ciliary body, just think of it like this, if I have strings coming off of my arms to the limb, if I make them, if I do like that, the strings are going to be limp. And the natural tendency of the cornea is to round up. So if I'm looking at something close, I need my cornea, my lens to be rounded up. If I'm looking at something far away, it needs to be more flat. And in order to be more flat, what you do is you relax the ciliary body that tightens the zonular fibers that stretches the lens. That's how that works. That's called accommodation. And that is a somatic response. That's not autonomic. So if I'm looking from that to here, that's accommodation. So when you're examining a patient, one of the things you do is you take your finger, look at my finger, and you, you test the eye muscles, the extraocular muscles, we'll go over that in just a second, and then I do like this. So I'm testing accommodation. The other thing when I do that, her eyeballs have to converge, right? They have to converge to track it inward. That's called convergence and accommodation. Or accommodation and convergence. This is how you get the autonomics to the eye. The 
third cranial nerve, remember that had a box around it. There's a ganglion that hangs off of V1 in the orbit. It's called the ciliary ganglion. Preganglionic parasympathetic enters the back of the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. That's the third cranial nerve, right? These preganglionics will sit out through the ciliary ganglion and go by short ciliary nerves to enter the eye. Sympathetics are much more complicated. We went through them the other day. Preganglionics are located down in T1. They're going to synapse in a cervical chain ganglion, mostly the superior cervical chain ganglion, catch a ride on the internal carotid, hop off on the ophthalmic artery, which is going to take them right into the orbit, pass into the eye, and there they go with the dilator pupillae, the postganglion. Uh, I've already explained the um, ciliary body. One other point that I want to make, though, is there's a little, there is fluid that's produced in the anterior chamber. It's called aqueous humor. You know that. Vitreous humor occupies uh, the retinal, the globe itself, behind the, the lens. The vitreous humor that you were born with is all the vitreous humor you're ever going to have, essentially. <coughs> you don't synthesize more of it. You do constantly synthesize aqueous humor. You turn it over. You produce it and then you drain it through that little hole right there. That's the canal of Schlem. Canal of Schlem. It's not labeled on this slide, but if you go back to uh, <coughs> this slide here, it's labeled. It's labeled on this slide. Uh, somewhere over here, Schlem, Canal of Schlem. So that's how you drain aqueous humor back into the venous circulation through the Canal of Schlem. If you block the Canal of Schlem, that's glaucoma because the aqueous humor pressure builds up. That's glaucoma. <coughs> <coughs> Here are the fibers uh, with the ciliary body uh, that I showed you before. You know, you can take out the lens, and because it only deals with 10% of refraction, you don't need glasses. But you can't live without, you can't see with, well without your cornea. So you have to, if you have a cataract, the cataract is of the lens. They actually have a lens that's artificial. It's like a little piece of plastic, and they can stick, they open the capsule, suck the, uh, the lens out, and put an artificial one in. They don't actually suck it out like jelly. They have, they have a little thing. They make a cut in the lens, and they have a little probe that has a suction tip on it. They put it in there and uh, stick it onto the lens and pull it out as one piece. And then they just take the artificial one and tuck it in there. Is that how they fix cataracts? Huh? Is that how they fix cataracts? Uh huh. Yeah. My dad had that done last week. Your what? My dad had that done last week. Oh, really? Week. Yeah. Okay. The optic disc is here, where the retinal fibers enter and leave the posterior aspect of the globe to form the optic nerve. If you look into the eyeball, so if you look through the pupil at the retina, as you'll be doing in your physical exam here in a few weeks, this is what you see. There's the optic nerve right there. there are the, there's the central artery and vein of the retina coming through there and branching out to supply the retina. This is more towards the nose. A little bit towards the lateral side is this darkened area. That's called the macula densa. That's where most of the comb 
five receptors are that provide your highest uh, density of, or your most acute vision. That's why at night, in low light, you try to see something, what do you do? You kind of turn your head to see it. What you're trying to do is you're trying to refocus your, you're trying to turn your head so that the light hits the macula densa. You don't even know you're doing this. But that's why. Uh, the two optic nerves come together as a structure called the optic chiasm. And then posterior to the chiasm are the optic tracts that end in the brain's uh, part of the brain. So optic nerves, optic chiasm, C H I A S M, optic tracts. If you have lesions of these structures, it produces different effects because of how these retinal fibers. go in these structures. Now, let me show you. If you are looking at the lateral, the temporal retinal field, it sees the nasal retinal field, right? So if there's my retina, light is coming in that way. It doesn't bend when it goes in your eye. It comes in that way. Right? Your temporal retina sees your nasal retina, uh, visual fields. Your nasal retina sees the temporal visual fields. So if I'm looking at an object over there, if I see it out of the corner of my eye over there, understand that it's hitting this temporal retina and that nasal retina. Correct? <coughs> Now, if I cut the optic nerve there, it doesn't take a genius to figure out you're going to have blindness in that eye. If I cut the optic tract, if I cut the optic tract that you see here, notice that I'm going to be cutting these temporal fibers that see that nasal visual field, and I'm going to see these nasal fibers to see that temporal visual field. So I will lose half of my vision on the other side. So if I cut my right optic tract, I'm going to lose my vision on the left. This is called homonymous hemianopsia. Homo, same. same side is hemi, A is without, opia is vision. <coughs> In this particular case here, if you cut the right optic tract, you're going to have left homonymous hemi and opia. I guarantee you this is on the National Board exam. If you cut the crossing fibers of the optic chiasm, what you're going to lose are both nasal retinal fields to see both temporal visual fields. You'll wind up with bitemporal hemianopsia. Is that more than just your peripherals? So it's like when you say peripheral, it's all the way around. This is just this half of the visual field, the temporal half of the visual field. When you are in lab today, you'll see that the pituitary gland sits right here. sits right up underneath that chiasm. A pituitary tumor will put pressure on the optic chiasm. The most common type of pituitary tumor is a prolactinoma. So if I have a woman who's, or a man, if I have a woman who is not lactating, or a man, come in saying, I'm having this nipple discharge, headache, 
first thing you do is you examine their visual fields. Because if you have a pituitary tumor that's pressing on that optic nerve, uh, optic chiasm, when I get you to cover one eye, cover one eye. So she's got bitemporal hemianopsia, right? So when I do this with this eye, she can't see it. But if I do this, she can because it's getting the temporal retina. And then I do it in the other eye, and she can't see her temporal visual fields. This is the examination of visual fields. You'll start doing that too. Okay? Any questions? I think we've already been through that. Uh, do you need to take another break? we got a few more minutes to go. Take a break, and we'll come back. You want? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tried to look for glasses like the one that's on my mind. I started to look at the one that's on my mind. I probably continue to do this. I hate to say that settings are in the now. I wrote out some services and stuff, and I Because all the lectures I've watched. It's just Okay. No, I know. The reason the color from here. From this eye, so this eye's covered. Oh, well, this eye's covered. So so this eye's covered. Kind of. So I don't understand how I feel like I'm not going to be able to do that. That's why. But with this, you can have your temporal here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to learn it segmentally. You could see it. You were saying that I need to take the time to put it all together. I already wrote three watch. I'm looking at the thing. We're zooming in the Hmm? Oh, there it is. Right here. So, well, this one is, it's cut back in a track. Five, or one to five or one to yeah. Right. One like right in the middle. <laughs> oh my god, my nose will not so funny. Yeah, you can only see the nose of your eye to wear. It's hard to see through glasses. So, it's a
This one up here, the most superficial one though, goes to the eyelid, the upper eyelid. That's called the levator palpebrae superioris.